family, greetings in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I trust that you're well and blessed this morning. I'm receiving the tithes and offerings. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke 6, verses 38. It reads, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And so we see here that the Bible teaches clearly that the measure that you use will be the measure that will be returned to you. And so when you study the word measure, the word measure simply means the portion. And so whatever portion you give, that portion will be given back to you. Now what's interesting here then is that you determine your harvest. And so if you increase your measure because you want a greater harvest, then God's word promises you that as you increase your measure or your portion of sowing, you can increase the harvest that you'll receive in Jesus' name. I want to read the same verse of Scripture, Luke 6.38, in the Passion Translation, and it reads, Give generously, and generous gifts will be given back to you, shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. Your measurement of generosity becomes the measurement of your return. And so when you are generous, when you walk or operate in generosity, the Bible says that this outflow or your return of your harvest, it, the Bible says it will be over the top. It will be abundant. It, it reminds me of Psalm 23, where the Bible says, He anoints our head with oil, our cup runneth over. And so I want to encourage you, family, if you are trusting God for more, if you are trusting God to expand you, to increase you, to multiply you, then very simple principle in Luke 6.38. The measure that you give will be the measure that you receive. In essence, what the Bible is teaching us here, Dr. Luke, it's very, very simple. He's saying that you determine your harvest. How amazing is that? And so I want to encourage you. If you're trusting God for more, for increase, if you're trusting God for restoration, if you're trusting God for open door and opportunity, then I want to encourage you. Be generous. Sow sacrificially. And you'll be amazed at the outcomes that you'll get in Jesus' name. Allow me to pray for every family that's faithful in the area of their tithes and offerings and that's generous in the area of sowing seed. Let me pray. Father, as I stretch forth my hands, I reach out my hand in faith to every faithful tither, to every faithful family member that's obedient and sacrificial in the area of giving. And now, God, I pray for supernatural grace. Your word declares that there is a measure of great grace that can be released. I pray for great grace over our people. That, Father, as they give sacrificially, I place a demand. You said in your word that we must try you. We try you, Father, for every faithful servant, every faithful steward. And, God, we declare that your word will not return void, but we will receive our harvest in the name of the Father and the Son and the precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, good morning, family. Greetings in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We trust that you're well and blessed. We trust that God is caring for you and nurturing you and protecting you over the season. We thank God that we see the, you know, the, the, the virus. We see that the, those infected is coming down drastically. We see the recovery rate is growing up drastically. And so there's such wonderful signs to see what God is doing. We see that the, the vaccine is out. And so we trust in God and we believe in God that God will show himself strong over the season. But again, I want to just encourage you to be wise and be safe at the season and look after yourself. And, and as you do that, God will continue to protect you. And then secondly, you know, we um, every Monday morning, every Wednesday morning and every Friday morning, we, uh, we want to have focused, targeted prayers. And so this past week, we, pr we focused on uh, unemployment, loss of business, promotion, increase, etc. And we trust in God for breakthrough. This, in this new week, we have a new focus. And we want to encourage you, get involved in prayer. Pray for your brothers. 
pray for your sisters, and it will help you in Jesus' name. Now, we're going to come around um, the Word of God this morning, and our theme for the year is living in Eden, and our anchor verse is found in Psalm 36, verse 8. It reads, All may drink of the anointing from the abundance of your house. All may drink their full from the delightful springs of Eden. And so we see that God's heart and God's desire is to bless us, family, that we clearly see that the house of God is a house of abundance. And you know, family, the reason why we've chosen this particular theme is because we are so clear that everything that the devil wants to do is to rob us from living in Eden. We are not uh, of, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We are of the kingdom of God, and we rule and reign from the throne of God in Jesus' name. So allow me to pray for you as we prepare to receive the word of God this morning. Let us pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father God, that, Lord, as we look to your word, you said you exalt your word above your name. And so, Father, we understand that even you submit to your word. Therefore, God, we choose with our whole hearts to submit to your word. We choose, Father God, to yield to the spirit of the living God. And this morning, as we come around your word, we thank you for insight and understanding. We thank you, Lord, that you'll show yourself strong on our behalf in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And so, this morning, we're going to continue, family, and we've been looking at a strategy on how we could get to a place where we can live in Eden. And, and as we began to look at it, we began to see in Genesis chapter 2, as God begins to describe Eden, there's not much that we find in terms of strategy. But as you continue to study deeper, and we, we're looking at the, the four rivers, as we study the meaning of each of these rivers, we begin to see a clear strategy that unfolds that will help us accomplish or live in Eden. And so the first river uh, that we find is the river Pison, and the river Pison means to grow up. Amen, to grow up. And, and so in order for us to become all that God would have to be, we're going to have to develop and mature and become all that uh, God would have us be. Uh, the second river means, uh, which is uh, Gion, and that river means labor to bring forth. And so not only must we grow up and mature, but we must also get involved in the kingdom of God. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. And so seeking the kingdom is working the kingdom, working the word, so that we can get the outcomes. And so labor to bring forth. Uh, the Bible, Jesus said that, that they shall be known by their fruit. And a farmer, a farmer only receives fruit based on his labors. And if we are prepared to work the word of God, we'll get the outcomes that God has for us. And then the third river is the river Hedical. And so I want to read a portion of scripture here, uh, and then we'll go into and continue uh, where we are. So Genesis 2 from verses 10, it reads, Now a river went out of Eden toward the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pison. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilia, where there is gold, and the gold in the land is good. Delium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gion. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third is Hedical. It is the one which goes towards the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, when we began to look at the, the river Hedical, we you don't get a definition of the word uh, Hedical in the Bible. But what you do find very clearly is that they you begin to see the writers describe this river. And if there's two things that stand out when they describe this river, is number one, it was a rapid river. And a, a river would, that's rapid, meaning a fast-flowing river, is a dangerous river. And there's lots of obstacles like rocks and boulders and waterfalls and so forth and so on that you'll find in this river. And so we began to see that it's, it's a very dangerous river uh, at certain parts of it. Um, and we looked at that last week, and we began to look at the season that we're in as a church and a, a, as, a, as a family, as a nation, and even globally, that we are living in very perilous and challenging times. And, and, and we went through that, and we began, God began to give us a strategy on how we can overcome these difficult and challenging times. The second uh, uh, definition that we find uh, about this river is that not only was it a dangerous river or, or rapid river, but it was also a very long river. And, and 
we st as you study the, the, the Herical River, it was over 160 kilometers long. And so it's a very long river. And so what, what does it speak of? It speaks of that, that not only are you going to find yourself in difficult seasons from time to time, but over and above that, even though we find ourselves in difficult seasons, we still have to plan long term. And so in order to, to accomplish your assignment, in order to fulfill the, the will of God in your life, you cannot plan short term. You have to plan long term. Amen. And so this morning, we're going to look at the concept of endurance and how, you know, we want to ask some really pertinent questions on how we can build structures within, systems within us that will allow us to endure the challenges and the difficulties of life that we face so that we can get the outcomes that God has for us. And so let's start in Hebrews chapter 12, reading verses 1. It says, Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so note, every child of God has a race that is set before them. Now, every race, there's a starting point and there's a finishing point. Amen. And so I'm not sure, I don't know where you are in your race. Some might be just starting. Others might be going through the first uh, phase or first quarter. You might be halfway through or you might be on the second part of your race. But you must understand that this race, there's a starting point. And there's a finishing point. Amen. And so it becomes important for us to understand that. Now, the word endurance, uh, when you study it, this is what it means. It means the ability to endure an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way. And so, family, we must understand then that when we are, if we are called to endure, then we cannot give way. What does it mean to give way? It means we cannot give up. We cannot disqualify ourselves. Though the season may be challenging and difficult, we have to be clear that we are not called to give way. Even if you fail, failure is only fatal if you don't get up, dust your pants, and move forward. And so we've all failed. But I'll tell you something, family. We are not going to let go of that which God has for us. When you study the word endurance in the Hebrew, it takes on a, quite a different picture. The word endurance in the Hebrew means this. It means persistent, persevere. It means suffering, misery, affliction, and torment. And so you see, family, when you begin to understand the concept of endurance, I tell you, man, we are running this race because we know that there is a prize that is set before us. Amen. And that prize is is living in glory. Amen. That prize is fulfilling the will of God. That prize is establishing the kingdom of God right here on the earth. And so we see then that we're going to have to be consistent, persistent. We are going to be tormented. We're going to go through misery. Amen. It's going to be a challenging, a difficult task. But God would have us know that we have what it takes to endure, to become all that God would have us be. And so the question I want to answer this morning is, how do I prepare to endure these challenges? How do I prepare to endure these challenges? The first thing we'll start off with is with Jesus. If you look at Luke chapter 2 and reading verses 42, it says there, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Verse 46 says, Now, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Now, this is a picture here of Jesus at the age of 12. And what we see here is that Jesus, even at the age of 12, was a brilliant young man. I mean, he was... These men that he was speaking to and sharing the oracles of Christ, these men were seasoned men. These men were part of the judicial system. They were scribes and Pharisees and high priests. Amen. And these men were learned men. And yet Jesus at the age of 12, he could, they, they marveled at his wisdom. They marveled at his intellect. They marveled at his revelation. And yet 
When you study the life of Jesus, Luke chapter 3, verses 23, it says there, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. And so what we see here, and what I want to bring to your attention, family, is that God knew the assignment that Jesus uh, had to fulfill. And because of the severity, because of the, the enormity of this assignment, God knew that Jesus would need it to be trained effectively. And so even though he operated in significant wisdom at the age of 12, Jesus still needed a further 18 more years of training and of development, of growing and of maturing, so that when he steps out at the age of 30 to, to accomplish the will of God or the assignment of God for his life, he would be prepared for his God-given assignment. And so you see, family, preparation... Plus, no opportunity equals failure. No preparation plus opportunity equals failure. But preparation plus opportunity equals success. And so God knew that even Jesus needed to go through a season of training and development so that in those 18 years, he would be prepared for the assignment that God has for him. And so this becomes very important. But and so this morning, I want to look at how do we prepare for the assignment that God has? How do we prepare that no matter what we go through, we can endure and overcome? And the, the key focus this morning is this. We have to build systems. We have to build systems in place that can allow us to accomplish the will of God for our lives. Now, before we go into that, in this season, and this is a trying and challenging and difficult season, before we even look at how we can build systems, I want to show you, just share two things that are very important to you and for you in the season. Number one, give everybody, including yourself, extra grace. Because we're not living in normal seasons. We have to give everybody extra grace in the season. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 verse 33. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. You see, family, we have to understand that we need to release great grace. We need to understand that, that there are people in the season that will experience loss, failure, and disappointment. Amen. We need to understand that there are people in the season that we need to treat with kindness and love and not expose them and not expose the difficulties and the challenges that they're going through. However, however, as we release great grace upon people, as we walk in, in grace in the season, we cannot compromise the word of God. So there's a difference between exercising great grace over people as opposed to compromising. Amen. And so we cannot compromise, but we must walk in great grace. And everybody that we meet, we must Release this great grace upon them. And the second thing I want to encourage you in the season, make every effort not to take things personally in the season. You cannot afford to take things personally. Listen to me carefully. You are not responsible for the global downturn in the economy. You are not responsible for the global health crisis. You are not responsible for the government legislation that is made over the season. So there's, there's not much that you can do. These are called no control problems, amen. And so you cannot take it personally. When you begin to look from a church perspective, every single church in the entire world has been affected by this coronavirus, every single church. And so family, you cannot take this personally. You have to understand that this is a no control problem. And so when we deal with ourselves, this is the point. Don't be hard on yourself. Don't come down hard on yourself because you're not getting the outcomes that you want. You have to understand the lay of the land, understand the season that you're in, and make the necessary adjustments so that you can become an overcomer and become all that God would have you be. And so I'll, let's go back, and I want to deal with the concept uh, this morning of building systems. Let's start with Noah and go with me to, uh, in your Bibles, um, to Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible says there, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now, when you begin to look at Noah, Noah didn't just build an ark. 
Noah built a system. Because you must understand that God would allow the rain to come upon the earth and there would, Noah understood that there would be an extended period of time that he would have to remain on the, on the ark, not only when it rained, but even after the rain. Amen. And so Noah needed to build a system that would preserve his family and preserve the animal kingdom, the bird kingdom, etc. And so Noah knew that just placing every animal on an ark, it would be chaos. And so he had to build systems in place that could ensure that all the animals and all the, uh, the bird life could be preserved. Not only that, but also uh, humanity could be reserved. And so more than just building an ark, you're going to have to understand Noah had to dig into the knowledge of God, into the wisdom of God, so he could build an ark and within that ark have a system that could preserve the animal, the bird, and humanity. And how important is that? And so when you begin to look at systems, it becomes so important for us to understand that we're going to have to understand and operate in the knowledge of God. Now, to become proactive, we are going to have to improve, develop, and work on our current systems. And that becomes so important for us. You see, family, a system allows you to bring your goals and objectives to pass. Goals don't determine results. We must be clear on that. Everyone, those that are winners in life, and those that are losers, those that are successful and those that are unsuccessful, they all have goals. We all have goals. We all have dreams. The difference between the person that is successful and the person that is unsuccessful is the system. Goals don't determine results. Systems determine results. Look what James Clear mentioned. He said, you don't rise to the level of your goals, but you fall to the level of your systems. And so family, we must understand that having a goal is wonderful. But the question is, this, what is the mechanism or the vehicle that will carry your goal from inception to fulfillment? And that is a system. And so if you can begin to look at the systems within your life, and ask yourself the question, are the systems transporting my goals from a desire, from a thought, from a wonderful plan to a place where it is now fully realized? And that's what we want to deal with this morning. So the first question we ask is, what is a system? A system is how you accomplish the what. How do I get from where I am to where I need to be? How do I get from what I'm experiencing to what I believe God would have me experience. A system is how I accomplish the what. It's how you plan, how you delegate, and how you implement. And these things become so important. And so let's start by looking at our church in the season because let's be relevant for where we are. When coronavirus started, one of the first things that we had to adjust is that we had to have a strong online presence. And so we moved uh, not only from in-person when we, when we could, but we moved to online. And the online experience was not only to nurture those on a Sunday morning, but also to look at all the different areas of the church, the different activities of the church, and see how we could sustain those areas, whether it be children's church, intercession, etc. And so we began to look at it, and one of the things that we found is that we've had to become very creative in our online experience to keep people connected. And one of the things that I believe worked very well was our fast, where we looked at a way to connect people, to have people a part of it without them even coming into uh, the, the house of God. And so we have to first, the first thing is that we have to look at the systems and make the adjustments in the season. The second thing that we have to look at is that, you know, family, in lean seasons, you begin to see where there's extra fat, so to speak. And so what we looked at is, in a lean season, we began to look at the structures of our church, the systems that we operated in. And you know, when you're in a season of abundance, sometimes you overlook certain things. But when you're in a lean season, you put a microscope on every aspect and every area of your life, of your business, 
of your, 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 your family uh, of the ch- and the church itself. And so what we began to see is that there are ways and means to make adjustments in the season so that we can get better outcomes or greater outcomes. And so we learned that in a lean season, as we put a microscope on every area of the ministry, there were some major adjustments and in other areas, some minor adjustments that we could make. The third thing we found is that with the purpose for restructuring or, or, or revisiting our systems and tweaking them was so that we can get maximum outcomes. Amen. Because family, you must exchange your life and your energy for maximum outcomes. And so we began to look at areas where we can make some adjustments, restructure the system so that we can get maximum outcomes. And then lastly, we had to adjust our vision for the season that we are in. And one of the things about the season that we looked at right on the onset is that we knew then that uh, there would be a major challenge economically, and so we wanted to focus on helping people with food. Amen. And God has been so gracious over the last 11 months. We've been been faithful in that area, and we've been assisting. And in this past month, we've managed to feed and distribute over 500 food hampers. Amen. Not only to families within the local church, but to a number of organizations, uh, orphanages, and so forth and so on, that has become a tremendous blessing to those organizations. And so, family, you, you must understand that when you begin to look at systems, you know, it's different systems for different seasons. And so we have to begin to become mature in the way we visit and what we, we do. Now, strong systems make good leaders look great. Weak systems make great leaders look weak. Amen. So, you know, family, it becomes so important for us to understand that no matter who you are or where you're from, anyone can improve, anyone can grow, anyone can experience increase if they are prepared to develop the systems within them. And so, you know, why do we systems matter so much? Why are systems so important? Number one, systems create behavior. We, we create a behavior, a pattern, amen, and that pattern creates, it impacts our behavior. And that becomes part of our lifestyle. Number two, behavior creates habits. Amen. And so our, our behavior becomes our habits. And habits that you repeat over and over becomes part of your psyche of who you are. But habits drive our outcomes. And so you see, family, we must understand the significance of systems. Now, let's look at Daniel. And uh, when you begin to understand Daniel, uh, and not just Daniel, but most of the great men and women in the Bible, before they became great, before God elevated them, before God used them mightily, if there's one sure thing, as you study their lives, you'll begin to see that there was a system in place that they respected, that they adhered to, and that brought them outcomes. And so if you go, go with me to Daniel Chapter 6 and verses 10, the Bible says there, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his window open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knee three times that day, and prayed and gave thanks before God. But here's the key. As was his custom since early days. And so we see that David's, uh, Daniel's system, it drove him. It was something that, It wasn't the first time that he found himself praying and facing Jerusalem three times a day. But this was a system that he had in place many years. Amen. And because of the system, it eventually brought him to a place where he could experience success. In any part of your life, if you want a better outcome, create a better system. You want a better outcome? You're going to have to look into your heart, look into your life, and make changes, small changes, small adjustments can yield significant outcomes. Amen. The question is, are you mature enough to make those changes in your life? And you see, family, this is so important. It's the changes and the adjustments and the disciplines that no one sees. But when they see the outcomes, that's what they want. So they don't see the discipline. They don't see the system in place that you're repeating day in and day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in and year out. They don't see that. But when they see the fruit 
And when they see the outcomes, that's what they want. And so family, nothing just happens. You're going to have to understand it's implementing a system. Because remember, we're dealing with the concept here of endurance. How do I endure? You will endure if you have a proper system in place that will discipline you so that you can get the outcomes that God has. And so you're going to have to be clear. You either have a system by intention or intent, or you have a system by default. If you have not developed a system intentionally, then you must know that the systems or how you live are systems by default, and systems by default will destroy your life. And so you're either uh, in one of two places. You're either in a place where you're going to have to create a system, or you're in a place where you're going to have to tolerate a system. And I want to encourage your family, if whatever you're tolerating, you will never get the outcomes that God has for you. We have to get to a place where we stop tolerating and we start creating godly systems in our lives that will yield fruit and give us the outcomes that God has for us. And so the key, the key then is that we must get organized. We must begin to put areas of our life in place or in order. Look at the systems, examine the systems and ask ourselves, am I getting the outcomes that God has? Systems either build people or destroy them. Systems cause you to grow and develop in key areas of your life. And so the question I want to pose today is, the next question is this, what is the purpose of a system? What is the purpose of a system? The key purpose of having a system is to communicate effectively with every member of your family, in your workplace, in the church, or in the organization that you work in. Amen. And so effective communication involves the quality of every, uh, sorry, effective communication improves the quality of every family. And so if I have a system in place that my wife understands, a system in place that my child understands, a system in place where we know this is how we run our household, this is how we do what we need to do. If I have a system in place in my business where every member or every person that's employed in that company knows the system, I can assure you one thing, we will get the outcomes that God has. When you begin to look at your body, the blood and the nervous system, very interesting. It is a system. And if blood doesn't flow to one area of your body, that body ceases to exist or it dies and it doesn't function effectively. And so when you begin to understand your life and the makeup of your life, if you don't have proper systems in all the areas of your life, then the areas that you don't have proper systems, you adapt a system by default and you will never get the outcomes that God has for you. And so we have to get to a place where we have to implement systems within our lives. And so as we move on, how do I implement a system? Three questions you have to answer. Number one, what do I expect or what are my objectives? What do you want out of life? What do you want from the kingdom of God? What is your God-given assignment? What is your objective in life? You have to ask that question. Number two, how will I be rewarded? If I submit to a system, if I exercise a system, if I practice it day in and day out, what will be my reward? You know, even David asked the question. He asked uh, when, when faced with Goliath, he said, is there a cause? And, and what was he saying? What is the what is the purpose? What is the reward for the man that will take out Goliath? Those areas in your life that have no systems are like Goliaths. And they will trouble you and haunt you and rob you from your destiny. Because Goliath stood before the nation of Israel and robbed them from possessing what God had for them. But I tell you, the moment you can stand up and you can implement a system, you, you will be amazed as you implement it effectively, the rewards that you will receive. And then the third question you must ask is, what should I correct or adjust? Because as you embark on the journey of becoming, you begin to see that not everything that you have or is doing is correct. And so you need to make the, the adjustments so that we can get the outcomes that God has. And so let me close with this. What are the systems within you? Your health is the system that you have. Is it by accident? Or have you designed a system in terms of your diet? Are you eating correctly? Are you exercising enough? Amen. Uh, uh, 
Those are systems that you have to put in place to ensure that your body's in a place where it's healthy. Number two, when it comes to your mind, are you developing your mind intellectually? Because intellectual capacity is so important. Are you developing your mind? Are you, are you feeding your mind? Your mind is like a muscle. The more you feed it information and knowledge and, and revelation, the more it will strengthen and grow. And so, are you feeding your mind? Are you feeding uh, your, 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 your intellect capacity so that muscle can grow and develop? And then number three, your spirit man. Are you nurturing your spirit man? Are you growing your spirit man? What are the systems that you have in place spiritually that will cause you to grow and develop as a child of God? Because you see, family, if we don't develop in those three areas, we will never be able to endure the challenges and the difficulties that life throw at us. And so this morning, this is a very simple yet such a profound message because the systems that we build our lives on, the systems that are built into us, they determine the capacity that we have to endure that I will not let go and I will not give in and I will not give up until I get the outcomes that God has. And so even though it is extremely challenging and difficult in the season, but I know that the system that God has given me through His wisdom will carry me and give me the outcomes that God has for me in Jesus' name. I'm going to pray for you this morning. I'm going to pray, God, that even though it's so challenging and difficult in the season. But Lord, we are soldiers. And as soldiers, Father, we are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And Father, we will soldier through every season. No matter how difficult the terrain is, no matter how difficult the season is, we will soldier through. Because we know that there is a prize that is set before us. That if we soldier through, we will get the outcomes that God has for us. And so Father, we will endure as a soldier. Because we know that we are guaranteed victory in Jesus' name. Close your eyes and bow your hearts. Allow me to pray. Father, as I stretch forth my hands, I stretch forth my hands to every family. I declare that every family, Father, will begin to look into their lives, look into their hearts, look into their minds, and begin to examine the systems that are in place. And God, I declare that as they examine those systems, I speak that there will be an adjustment that will take place, Father God, that they will begin to tweak the systems. And those systems that are formed by default, I declare that those systems will be removed. And Father, by intention, they will form systems, godly systems, righteous systems, systems that will yield fruit and outcomes in Jesus' name. God, I command blessings upon your people in the name of the Father and the Son and the precious Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. God bless you. Stay strong, stay focused, and stay safe in Jesus' name.